Thank you, Alf, for allowing me back through your front door after what was. Thank you, Alf, for allowing me back through your front door after what was a mammoth session yesterday, and thank you very much for your patience and allowing me back. Um, we both had a good night's sleep subsequently, and if I can begin by picking up where we left off yesterday, and that's just a nip round the corner from the high street, and if you can tell us a little bit about the businesses in Kingsbury Street and then down into the parade. Okay, Ian, thank you. Thanks for coming again. As we turn round from the 144 I Street, we go straight into number one Kingsbury Street, big imposing building, Victoria House, which is used to house the Irwin's Grocery Shop during the war and immediately after. Now it's become the uh, Oxfam Shop. One of the buildings that belongs to the Morwood Town Council, they own that place. Going round a bit further, there's two shops where Slopers belong to Slopers. The first one was the Gents Outfitters, and the second shop was a ladies one. A Mr. Mr. Fulliger was manager of the Gents, and a Miss Fulliger at one time was manager of the ladies shop. And was that a shop that was on one or two floors? Or? That was on one floor. Although you could, there were stairs at the back of both places, you could get one to the other. There was a little showroom at the top, but basically most of it was down on the ground floor. One of the old, well-respected businesses where they walked around with their tape measures round their neck, as proper tailors do. Very well-respected business there. Next door was a little, now it's now a little bookshop, and that was a private house then. Before we came to Church Farm Dairy, that's been a dairy a long, long time. Now that has now become 2XS, a drinking wine bar. Next door, number 10, was the clinic where the babies went to be weighed and measured, little dental treatment, and that was run by the um, different various health things. Now it has become a private house. Number 9 was the home of Miss Salisbury at one time. Miss Salisbury was a dear old soul. She was a music teacher and she was the organist and choir master of St Peter's Church down the far end of the town. Her nickname was, was Dapham because she was alleged that she had these big feet, which when she walked down the aisle of the church, they used to dap down. She was used to know, here comes dapping. But very, very nice lady, very, very clever. She lived there, and at one time, that house eventually became a dry cleaner's. Then there was a Mr. and Mrs. Easter lived there, and they had it as a, a guest house. Now a private house. Next door was the home of one of Marlborough's best-known doctors, Dr. Tim Morris. Former mayor of the town, his wife was a Wiltshire County councillor, did lots and lots of work for the town, and he was known as the baby doctor at Savonick Hospital for a great many times. Died last Christmas time. Next door was Ford's the solicitors, and still is Ford's the solicitors. The only other thing of interest, it's not a business, but when one goes up the hill onto the right hand side at number 29 Kingsbury Street, this at one time was the home of Dennis McCafferty, a former town choir and beadle of the town one of my predecessors now it was a private house and still is and coming down onto the right hand side we came to Rollins and Phillips eventually became the Warburg Times office um, now it is a private house coming on down further just where the road turns into Silver Street we have the Gazette and Herald office what that was before I haven't got the foggiest idea because I cannot remember anything else. It obviously wasn't a gazette and paper office not all those years ago, but I cannot remember what it was. We crossed Silver Street and to the next shop, bending your head down or else you'll, you'll hit your head on the, the low roof there, come to Dormy House. That, during the war, was a, a grocer shop, Figgins, well-known shop there to the town. Eventually when that went, that was the home for a few years during the war of um, the army commandeered the place as they played the pledges as they did, and that was a home of one of the military bands. Which one it was, I haven't got the foggiest idea, but I used to remember going here hear the music as I went by. Next door, a, an old pub, which is now gone, was the Bell and Shoulder. And was that a very large establishment? That was a large establishment, yeah, and a very popular watering hole that was. That went probably in the 1960s when that disappeared from use. And that became a little shop at one time, a little haberdashery shop. And there was a hairdresser's there, there was a little fireplace shop, now it's back to the hairdresser's, and I think that's all there is of any interest in there. Now, I know when you took on the role of town crier, you were largely teetotal. So, 
You're yes. probably not going to know too much about the inside of that particular. No, probably never. Uh, I can't ever remember going in it. I just thought I'd ask. Yes, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Because as it's no that longer far there, ago, it'd probably be interesting to find out what the interior. Yes, was like. that's right. No, I didn't ever go into that pub. Probably. Most of the pubs in them days, I probably didn't even go into there because I wouldn't. I didn't. wasn't born of a drinking family anyhow, and um, wartime drinking was probably a bit different. I was underage anyhow then, and um, can't remember which pub I went into first in this this place. But I certainly didn't go into the Bell and Shoulder. Well, it's the town's official ale tester. Yeah, I've certainly should... made up for it since. Yeah, it? that's right. Been every pub since. <laughs> <laughs> You're quite right there. Yeah. So going on down from Figgins's there in the Bell and Shoulder, we came to another little shop, Hillier's. That was a little vegetable shop. Hillier's Brothers, they used to have a couple of shops in the town, another one we'll come to in a minute, and they had their own little market garden. A very old place, didn't modernise at all. A wooden floor, which nowadays would be cast as a health hazard and that, but they got by. They sold you had some nice fresh veggies. Next door was Redwoods, which right at the beginning of my talk, before that was the place I first venture into the world of, of working for a living when I left school. Redwoods uh, Brothers was gents' outfitters. Across the passageway, which leads into St Mary's Church, we used to come across another ladies' haberdashers, come ladies' outfitters, Calverts. Buy anything there from a button to a suit or rolls of cloth or any. That was run by a former mayor of the town, Mr Calvert closed many years ago it's been all sorts of things since and at the moment the half it's been converted to two shops one is a, a wedding dress shop and the other one is an Indian restaurant we go down Perrins Hill down the steps that's a little place behind the town hall years ago there was a shoe shop there called Peckford's two people who used to work at Mondays and Sons my former employers Mr Peck and Mr Dunford they joined together and formed Peckfords, went in direct opposition to Mundy's round right the corner. Which was that Roger Peck from that's the Green? Roger Peck Green. From, from the Green, oh, yes, Audrey's husband. Since that, it became a Chinese restaurant, then it became an English restaurant. At the present time, it is a, an Italian restaurant, La Zavaroni, I think, is might be the word. That's not a bad pronunciation. Yeah. Yes, good, yes. And next door to that was the Kingsbury Tea Bar at one time. Many years ago, this is, and since that, it has been. There was a pine shop there. It's a little um, narrow boutique. Next to that, I cannot really remember that. There was a place called Mitchell's and Ironmongers. I rather suspect that somebody else will describe that in detail. This is when high walls had houses on it. So I will leave that one out and cross the road into New Road. The top of New Road, facing upwards towards Kingsley Street, was Weber's, a butcher's. And turn in the corner going down into the parade now. Well, can I just interrupt? Yes, you can. Weber's yeah. is where the, the old Itali Capricorno is, the other Italian, Italian restaurant, yes. Because you can still see the meat hooks hung up. And you can see the meat hooks, yes. The you can. The room, can't you? Yes, you can. Yes. yes, that's quite true there. Little hooks there. Some of the old fashioned places as meat was hung up. You didn't have health and safety worrying about them. The meat was hung near full stop. And there was dusty roads in them days, but nobody died from any germs, did they? <laughs> that was Weber's, another well-known place. Round the corner, into the parade, was another butcher's, Cooper's, next door to one another. And if you go into the left-hand, that's now into two places now. The left-hand place is an underwear shop. The right-hand place is an antique. If you go into either of them, you can still see places where the meat is, was hung up in years ago. they they got the old ceiling still. There's still a bit of old more about there. Mr. Cooper was a one-time mayor of Marlborough. Next door down, Mr. Burchell, a grocery shop, another well-established place. Mr. Burchell was a one-time mayor of Marlborough. All influential businessmen were in this town. And this was where? This was in Where Do It Yourself Rainbows is in the parade now. Oh, yes. Remember? Yes, yes that was Burchell's, a big grocery shop there. Mr. Burchell was a, quite a character. Well, remember him once. He used to walk around in the summer with his straw hat when he was getting on and his white jacket and meet people. He came across myself one day when I was pushing my daughter. She's only about 18 months. He looked at me, knew me I was here, and he looked at my daughter and said, Hello, you go for a walk with your granddad. I just kept quiet and I thought, good chap. He, he was quite happy I was granddad. I didn't tell mother. Next door, another little baker shop, Hart's Bread Shop. Another old place, made the bread in there, and I can remember them years ago when they had one of the first 
bread slicing machines I'd ever seen. As in them days, you cut your own bread as you want it. It was all full loaves, but they had a slice you could ask for your bread to be sliced whilst you waited. You and I see. think if you go into the pagoda, which it is now, which is now, yes, you can still see one of the old bread ovens in the wall. Can you really? That's yeah. still fixed within there. One yeah. of the historic plate. Yeah, that's probably a bit of um, ancient stuff. That is. Yeah, that was a big bakery then, and did did well there. A little bit further down, a couple of places down, it's now called Munchie's Sandwich Bar. It was O'Keefe's used to be, a little tiny sweet shop. A tall person would hit his head on the ceiling there, very, very low ceiling. And that was the birthplace of another predecessor of mine, another former town cry, was Johnny O'Keefe. He was born in that house there. And eventually, years and years ago, he, um, he had a little shop further down in the parade. And he, he converted it into a spa, a spa supermarket. He had it for a few years then, and some of the smaller supermarkets obviously couldn't get the trade as the others. And he he gave it up and went into the Merchant Navy and became the, I think I pronounced this drive, Chief, Cox, Chief Coxon on the QE2 till, until he retired from the sea. And, and would he, this shop have been where the Chinese... Uh, Takeaway and the chip shop. Chip shop, yes. Are currently they are currently there. That's yeah. right. And be between the two Chinese fish shop and that, there there was more. The furnishings came in there for a while mm. after Johnny O'Keefe. That was one place, and then they became two into the, as we said, the Chinese fish bar and the takeaway place there. All the businesses that you told us about within the high street and within the parade and Kingsbury Street. The earliest ones that you're mentioning, we're talking sort of about the 1940s, 1950s. 1950s, yes, that's right. Some of them probably stayed to the 60s. Hmm. The um, spa shop would have stayed to the 60s. Well, it wouldn't have probably, it wouldn't have been a supermarket much before that, but I can't remember what was there before. But that's about when some of them would, you see. And as we go on now next door to that, there was Hilliers, another branch of Hilliers, which I mentioned was in Kingsbury Street, another there. And that was there until probably the... 70s before they gave up the two brothers gradually got older and older and obviously in the end they they sold out to i think there was a little sweet shop miss coburn had a sweet shop there for a while and it's now all diaper noise all that area is now but towards the end of the parade there was another <laughs> another um outfitter shop was harroway's that was another busy place and funny enough another former mayor of marlborough and right on the end of the parade, before we get into London Road, was Minty Brothers. They had a little tiny shop electro thing and a little by odds and ends there. They eventually sold out to Sound of Music and then Head and Robins and now Dibble Noise have got the whole lot along there. So we come to the end of the parade there. Just across the other side, if we turn the back on ourselves, go round past the score, we come to a place which is an antique shop now it was a, a rope factory where they did actually make ropes Morrison's Rope Factory long since gone and further on now next to the fire station was the Congregational Church where our daughter was christened many years ago now that's an antique centre Just to finish off the subject of businesses I wonder if you can tell me whether there were many other types of businesses in the town that perhaps we, we no longer see in the town Yes, there's one or two come to name. The first one I'm going to mention was probably worldwide was Pelham's Puppets. This was founded by Bob Pelham when he came out of the army, obviously probably mid-1940s. He started making a little a puppet in his own home. He lived at Ogborn St Andrew, just opposite where my mother-in-law lived. And um, he gradually started up a little tiny factory. He had a little place in Victoria House in Kingsbury Street for a while till it grew too big and then he had this place along London Road which was a former laundry he took this over to start building these puppets eventually it grew and grew and grew that he would probably employed well over 100 people in the factory had units all over the place there and as well as that what was probably their biggest secret which made them the biggest employer they had dozens of home workers there was one person, I think I'm right in saying, his job was just going around people's houses, delivering homework, picking it up and bringing it back. Obviously, the the clerical side of that was very, very, very big, but very popular place. They used to run their own uh, their own magazine called Pell Pop. In my days as a postman, I used to have masses of mail for that place there. And I was interested in what you said about him beginning to make puppets at home, and it sort of developed from there. Did he actually run the business from Ogborne? 
at any particular time or did he start up straight away in Kingsley Street? He did, as far as I can gather, he ran it from home for a while because okay. he, he wouldn't have had offices there till it got really on its feet and then he obviously ran it from Kingsley Street before moving into um, the London Road place, the old uh, laundry place. But then it gradually became so big, his office staff was probably five or six people in there any one time working on the, the accounts. And we were talking of the days before computers. Everything was done sort of manually with all the accountancy. But, but um, eventually had some, some buildings on the opposite side of the river as well. So it was well spread out. A huge concern, really. And um, he died rather suddenly and seemingly gradually... I suppose times changed and children had different thoughts. They became collector's items as much as children's toys and gradually the business went and somebody bought it and ran it again and they, I think they took it to Cowan somewhere to do it but it's gradually lost its thing. I believe, I believe they are still yes, made. Yes, I yeah. think they In are. In my wife's family's toy shop they do still sell them. I think they do, yeah. don't they? Yes. Anybody's got one locked away in the attic, providing they got the box with it, it's probably worth more than now than <laughs> now than it was. Yeah. But Do you remember well. whereabouts in Kingsby Street the original factory was? Or? Yes, where um, the Oxfam shop is now above and behind the Oxfam shop. They had a little place there in between the time when it was Irving's and that closed, and this was a vacant place. They they worked from there. Yeah. And when I said it employed all sorts of people, my mother-in-law. This is long before I got married. She worked in the factory. Everybody who was anybody worked in Pelham's factory, the, where I lived in London Road, and all those people going backwards and forwards all the time day. And my wife worked there when I married her. She was, everybody seemed to have worked at Pelham's at one time. Lots of young mums used to as well. Yeah, they did, they had because the hours home. were, you could yeah. work in your hours to suit children. They were glad to have, not everybody started at eight to five, but you could have people coming in at different hours to fit in with the, with the schools. And then if you were at school on the days, you had to work at home. My own mum used to uh, capitate Pinocchio puppets. She used to attach the heads to the bodies. Oh, did, yeah, and they were all... <laughs> yeah, that's they, right, all sorts of things. You get a box of heads and a box of bodies. Yeah, that's and, right, uh, they were all... all she'd stick them all together yeah. and, and off they go in uh, with the collection that came around. That's that right, it came out with before, the, yeah. the chappy, the delivery yeah. man, came in and did all that. But very well-known place there. And probably, I think it's probably the same... A lot of countries in the world bought stuff from this this factory. They're very, very well known. What that, about any of the others, like the tannery, for instance? No, yes. Now, the tannery was another big employer of the town. They, obviously, with that, they didn't have home workers because it was all done in factory. And uh, <laughs> this place had numerous people, big high employer, big business employer there. And it was um, hidden, really, from a site. You only knew it was there because there was a big tall chimney. But it was a place that... There was loads of activity. When you went by there, you could smell the, the tanning being done. You see the stacks of skins out there seasoned in. That eventually went, moved away from the town. I think it became Wingrove and Edge. And they had another place down, probably Streetway. That's where leathers were needed, where shoes were made. The big factories for shoe making are there. <laughs> there. And um, so just they moved out of the town. Elf's laughter and hesitance has, has happened because their cat is just it's, it's after arrived. your seat. Yeah. sat on the table slap bang in the yeah, middle yeah, of us sorry. both and he wants your seat Ian <laughs> absolutely so yeah. uh, anyway we can see yes. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so he wants to sit <laughs> don't you son do you want to sit down there you've got to sit there oh, yeah. so. please be seated right yes. another um, big employer was Garrod Engineering that was one of the earliest people that went into the manufacture of record players radiograms and the old type wirelesses in the days when you had valve wirelesses, very, very big employer. They had a big place in Swindon, probably employed well into three figures of people, a big one. This is another firm that became worldwide. And the Marlborough factory had a dozen working there on different shifts. And unfortunately, this was another one that seemed to have got taken over when the revolution came with different record players came in and things changed. They seemed to have lost it somewhere and went into oblivion. That's no, I still got a Garrod record player. It's really old, but you had pieces of furniture. The radiograms were more of a piece of furniture than they were a functional. Mm. Does, does it still work? It says it works after a fashion. It's not the best it is now, but it's very. It's probably thirty-five years old. But can you, you still can... get the needles? Yes. Yes, they, they were styluses then, the old-fashioned style. But you can still get them in Swindon. There was a place in Swindon you can buy them. A price, <laughs> but they they went uh, away. Another uh, that's three big uh, high employers that um, left the town. 
Another place that was busy at one time was the gas works. A big enough gas works where they made their own gas base. A big enough place to have two gas holders, both now demolished. The coming of North Sea Gas gradually took away this um, thing there and we eventually became a little offshoot from Swindon Gas Works. So all the gas is piped from Swindon to Marlborough. The gas works is gone. They just have a little servicing place in the London Road in the yard there. And where that used to be, where all the buildings were, where the lorries used to come in, they used to go over a way bridge. The way bridge only was um, taken away a matter of eight or nine years ago. That was there forever and ever. There was a, a gas showroom there where you could pay your bill, you could buy your gas stuff there. A listed building, I hasten to add, and um, this site was eventually became Burt's the Builders. And when Burt's the Builders were there, the gas showroom still remained for people to pay bills. And boy, you could buy a gas cooker or gas things there. And this is directly opposite where the garage is. It there. is straight across the road from there, yeah. And the Waybridge stayed there whilst the the builders was there. When the the builders both um, died and the builders retired or came out of it there, the site there was sold, and it is now an old people's complex. And what happened to the building? The buildings, the old buildings, were virtually nothing. But there was a couple of buildings which were listed. There, there was a gas retort house, which I have reason to believe that was a listed building. But with big builders, all of a sudden, um, I went to work one day with the showroom. Oh, I didn't go to work with the showroom. I went to work <laughs> one day, and the showroom was there. When I came home tea time, the showroom had gone a JCB had flattened a lot. I thought this is one of Marlborough's buildings, which I understood to be listed. But big um, builders seem to have different laws, don't they? They seem to, yes. Yes. <laughs> the, the humble you and me, if we did that, we'd get taken to court for doing that, but let's just pass by. And the gas cylinders that they had must have been quite imposing for you because they yes. literally back onto the back of your property. They were. You could see, oh yes, and you could see where they go up and down. You know, when the, uh, people were using a lot of gas, they, obviously the gas holder would be uh, less high. And when they, it was um, quiet time, they, they would go up. You could see that. And you could obviously see them when they painted them. Took You'd them see them more in the summer then. Yes, that's yeah. what you did. Yeah, in the winter they were quite low. You get a cold spell, they more gas was used, and you could see them there. So I've got pictures of those things from the gas from the back door. They were part of the landscape from this household. No, no longer. Right now, Alf, I'd like to move from work to pleasure and uh, to entertainment. What can you tell us about Marlborough Town Band, which I believe you used to play in? Yes, I was fortunate. I don't know how I came to be taken there but I joined the band in 1946 I started to learn to play the euphonium and in those days you had to get to a certain proficiency before you were accepted as a member of the band this I did in April 1947 where I paid the grand sum of five shillings entrance fee and I still have the receipt for it and you were given a, a proper list of rules which I still have this was a as all towns and villages in those days had their bands, they didn't have any other entertainments. You didn't have television, the entertainment into the towns, you didn't have nightclubs and anything like that. And people worked together for these bands. A lot, many, many have gone now. All the villages had a band. But Marlborough Town Band seemed to go very well for a few years. It, long before I was born, it was a prize band, won lots of competitions. Uh, and in fact, they're, they're mentioned in lots of the history books of Marlborough. But um, I had a great amount of pleasure in that. I stayed with the band and playing euphonium with them till obviously I went to the army but fortunately when I came on leave I used to be able to help them out with engagements there but I stayed with them we had these green uniforms which seemed to be rather an odd colour in fact um, years ago this was blamed for the, the band winding up they thought it was an unlucky colour and the band gradually went downhill until about 1957-58 the interest gradually went Youngsters weren't coming into the thing. They had other interests coming in. They were sort of getting out. Times were changing after the war. They band gradually fell about. There's still a few bands were left in the town that I know. Great amount of pleasure. Played at some good jobs like the coronation. How many were there of you? At one time, we could probably muster up 25, 26 people. A good marching man, I might say. Did some good plays. Big plays. Remembrance Sunday was always a great sort of thing to do to march up the town there. And who was the band's leader when you were there? When I was there first, the conductor was Eric Free. Mm -hmm. 
He was their principal conductor. He was, as I've mentioned before, he was a six times mayor of Marlborough. He, he was a musician as well. He was a great violinist, although he didn't obviously play that in the band, but he knew his conductor and he, and he took the band regularly. And when he was not there, the other conductor was Fred Pike, a person who used to work for the, the Great Western Railway. He was a good cornet player and he used to lead the band. So we had people who knew what they were doing. And one time, when Fred had um, died, another person who came there was Bob Ashley. He was band master for a while, an ex Royal Marine band who knew was even bleeded out through facial paralysis, couldn't play anymore. But he knew his stuff. Ex Royal Marines have been taught properly. So we had good people teaching us. You talked about the coronation, but what were sort of your bread and butter performances? What did you do on a regular basis? On a regular basis, we used to play, it was an old tradition that in the summer, perhaps on a Monday night, was practice night all throughout the year obviously but in the summer perhaps once a month you go to a different place in the town and just give an impromptu concert you'd wear your uniform and it would be announced in the press you'd perhaps stand outside the town hall one week the next month you'd stand in the green next month in the parade the next month at the bottom end of the street remember we didn't have traffic worrying about you didn't have great big lorries going by to drown you in those days you could set yourself up in the middle of the green and play a programme of music and you were lucky to perhaps hear two or three cars go by and there was always people came out to listen to you they seemed to know which Monday of the month you were going to be there and put a box out one or two coppers would get thrown in it wasn't obviously coppers in them days we're going back a long long time 50 years ago and as well as playing around these different parts of the town you would go up to Samaritan Hospital now and again and play a little concert of a Sunday afternoon the matron would arrange for a cup of tea to come out to you. They'd bring out some of the patients to listen to you. It was a nearly like a garden party atmosphere, a wonderful atmosphere you could have. You enjoyed it because you knew the people were enjoying it. Another one you went to was the Children's Convalescent Hospital. You made arrangements with the boss of the place, Matron Harrell, great character there, and she would be only too pleased for you to go up there and sit and play in the grounds for a couple of hours, and the children would love you there. You say that the band finished because of lack of participation. Did the band just peter out, or was this a final concert? Or No, it, it gradually petered out. And then one day, I cannot remember the date, the band room fell down, and that was Amen. The band room was in um, Barn Street, and it just fell down across the road. But that was the end of Marlborough Town Band. Got some lovely memories of that, though. Another major form of frequent entertainment, shall we say, was MADOS, the Marlborough Amateur Dramatic and Operatic Society. You were very much a part of the group for a time. What can you tell us about it? This was another of the, the, the big things, very, very well supported at one time, a big um, membership there. I didn't start getting involved with them until I'd been in the army, came out there, and they were doing musicals then. To have a put on musical, you need a big cast, you need a backstage company to work this out. I was also playing a clarinet at the time. I was invited to take part in the pit orchestra. Big venture, I'd never done that before. And I thought, ooh, what's this like? But I, I went there, I thought it's local, I must give it a go. And I played in four productions. I played in Quaker Girl, Country Girl, Merry England and Rio Rita. Four years on the trot, they had these big musicals. There again, that was a lot of work. You rehearsed twice a week with soloists, you rehearsed with chorus, and then you had a, two or three rehearsals with the whole lot in the town hall. Now, for these, to use the town hall, they had the town hall for a week. The stage for the musicals had to be enlarged because you had a big cast, you had a big chorus, and you had a, the orchestra pit had to be all sorted out. So you had a lot of um, seated space had to be lost there, but they, they had this extension stage. I can remember this. This extension stage was always kept up the loft. It was uh, lots of trestles and lots of planks had to be all manhandled down from the, the loft by a little hoist. You spent the day half of the men had to turn up for the day and roll up their sleeves. You spent all day slogging to get this stage up. A Sunday morning, that was your most Sunday morning, setting the stage probably health and safety wouldn't be very happy with some of the things that happened in them days but everybody worked together and then there was this orchestra bit we had it, it was it was all handmade stuff these um, music stands all with electric lights in so you could sit there and read your music although the house was in darkness it felt really important like in one of the big theatres then when the musicals gradually faded away through people moved away or people died or interest gradually changed I, I did a back, bit of backstage work with the 
amateur dramatic side of it as opposed to the operatic side. And eventually I did a couple of plays acting in them. Then I got married and I suppose one thing or another, other things take over your life for a while. I still retained a bit of an interest, but then interest goes. The interest wanes and youngsters don't come on the same and they had their own rehearsal rooms then up in the yard between her shoe shop and Midland Bank lit up the cobblestones and they owned the own rehearsal rooms where they kept all their scenery. It was big enough to set up your stage exactly the same size as the town hall. You had workshops and all. It's now called the Nafferton Hall. Somebody else has taken that over. I remember going to a review in the early 1980s in the church hall in Silverless Street. Do you recall when it actually finished? No, it was probably well into the 80s. Now, moving on to something that is still thriving, and that is Marlborough's annual carnival, which I know you have many memories of. Do you know when it first started? I don't. I can remember as a kid, when I lived in Kingsbury Street and them, I'm sure at one time I can remember it used to come up Kingsbury Street and go along the top of the common to where our house it went out was it obviously went either went round Blown Street or Hur Street but from whence it started I didn't know in them days after the war obviously there were no carnivals in the war and I think I'm right in saying it was revived in 1950 by the then British Legion quite successful carnivals they had because why I think it was then was the first carnival I went in although I was in the army at the time it was home on leave was in August 1950 and I played in the band to go round there and that carnival started in Elkett Lane and that is a long way to march round there you did Elkett Lane, London Road, New Road, bottom side of the High Street, top side of the High Street, Silver Street, St Martin's, Blowhorn Street, down Hurst Street and finishing the Green and that is a long way you've already played at a fete in the afternoon that's a very long parade that isn't was it? a long parade that was a major street closure as well I imagine well that's right although the street closures are such then they just had police one either end traffic was nowhere near the same then I don't know when it finished going in the 50s they were strong but then there was a gap because they were then revived in 1975 I don't know when the gap started or how many years they were missing, but then the Round Table, I think I'm right in saying, Round Table revived it in 1975 and have been going on quite strongly because not only am I have memories of others, you have as well because you were involved as much as me, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> you got me into it. But they are still going, thriving now, although the route is different. Uh, road closures are a major job now. That's did the one. route of the procession change when it was revived in 1975? It did. Up to then it had started from Elkett Lane, as I said, but in 1975 it started from the Common, down Kingsbury Street, along the top side of the High Street to St Peter's, and along the bottom side, and finishing New Road. They dispersed there, and it's been that route ever since. Now the success of Marlborough Carnival has really always been judged by the number of floats that have taken part in the parade. And the procession, no matter how many other events that there are. That's Has it true. always been supported well in your experience? Yeah, for quite a few years, yes. I think one or two years, I think maybe people's attitudes changed. Years ago, every street used to organise a float, or every organisation, or every pub or club, but maybe not so many of them, but um, there's still enough interest to make something. I hope it still goes on a bit longer. It, does give a bit of light-heartedness to the town to show that we are capable of doing something and organising something. And, and I, it's I one of the very yeah. few occasions nowadays, I think, when the majority of the townsfolk all come together in one place. They do, and, yes. And that doesn't happen very often now, does it? Not nowadays, no, it doesn't. Not for one, one specific thing, it doesn't. I, I can speak for this as taking part in the carnival for many years. My position in the carnival is with the, the mayor and the mayoress, and you come down Kingsbury think you you think oh, there's not many people about but when you turn by the town hall the high street is just a sea of people and it really lifts you you think oh people have turned out because you don't see them or you don't hear them till you get to the, the bottom there the hair stand up on the back yes of the that's right I should perhaps say that when we discussed different carnivals when I said about the ones that started from Elkett Lane those carnivals were always held on August bank holiday which in those days was the first Monday in August before they changed it there. 
When it was revived in 1975, the Carnival Day was a Saturday after Springbank holiday, the end of May or just at the beginning of June. Nowadays they are held in September to coincide with other local carnivals. So the idea being that if people are in the carnival mood, they can get a float together and perhaps do two or three carnivals within the area, within a few miles. You've got Albourne, you've got Devizes and Pusey, all within a few miles, within a week of one another. Now, you talked about the coronation, uh, we've talked about the carnival, and Mados, and throughout the previous tape you've talked about other major events in the town. Were there any other one-off special events held in Marlborough that you have any particular recollections of? There was the one at the end of the war, when you just had a day off because peace was declared, wasn't it? And also, there was the victory parade in London and something happened in every town, which would have been 1946, something then. So I would have been there involved in that, probably had a little cut from that one there. Another one was the visit of the King and Queen of the Day in 1948. I, I wasn't involved in it except as a spectator. They came to Marlborough. That was King George the Sixth and Queen Elizabeth and were welcomed by the mayor and the corporation and, and came on the balcony. Hundreds of people came in the street to see them. And the coronation day, I played in the uh, town band for that one. So we had a busy day then. There was a, the little things happening in the street and the cup giving and there was a big pageant in the Marlborough College grounds. So. With a tremendous atmosphere. Yeah, oh yes, yeah. great atmosphere. Yeah. Because everybody joined in these things then. Nowadays, perhaps some people think, oh, I can't be bothered with anything, local, but everybody seemed to be involved in some way or another. And this is what gave everybody a boost. The atmosphere is all important. If people have got the right atmosphere, it goes well. It's good for morale. Too, it is, yeah. It really builds you up. But as for other things, there was probably the Festival of Britain was in 1950-something. But that didn't probably affect more of a great deal. You had the um, royal marriages maybe came along, but um, that was more... In them days, everybody had a day off just to watch the television. And other big royal occasions, it's just a matter of watching the television. Now, you're not involved in it in any other way. You take a day off because it's due to you, perhaps. There, but otherwise, it doesn't mean anything else. Moving subjects once again, uh, you must remember the latter days of the town's railway and stations. Do you have any particular recollections? This is not my greatest memory there, although I knew of the two stations we had, two stations, high level and low level. And what was the difference? The one I, I was more aware of was the one that was in Salisbury Road, where the um, Wiltshire County Council Yard, that one would go to Savonick one way and Swindon the other. That was the one that was I low never level. used. That was low level. I can never remember using the other one. can never remember going to it. I know it was up the top of Cherry Orchard Way somewhere on the old waste ground there, now built on. But I cannot remember much about that. It's, it was North actually East. where the adult training centre was. Somewhere there you know it was, was. yeah. The Warburg Donkey, they used to call it. The, the, the one that used to go from Warburg to Swindon used to bring people into work, funny enough, it was before buses, all the little villages, people could get on their little horse and come into Marlborough. Lots of people came by rail, and you could get to London, change it Savonet, a big um, junction there, long, long since gone, and you could get to London then, transfer there, get London Paddington from Marlborough in two hours. You can't get there much quicker now by car, can you? Not on park as well. And you could leave Marlborough at 8, get in Paddington at 10, leave Paddington at 6, and be back in Marlborough, home at eight o'clock which was reasonably good going for those days it's also a good place i used to have some relatives who lived in southampton a nice little run down there I used to love that one there I used to remember the trains used to bring the sheep in when it was the marble sheep fair they would bring some of the sheep although some of the sheep would come by road walk along the road and then there but some of them would come on to the railway unload there and walk the sheep to the common to the sheep fair another use some of the bigger circuses came to Morbin in those days. Some of the animals would come by railroad rather than on road, and they would unload the the animals there. I can well remember the, the parade they used to have from the station to the circus site, wherever that was. All on foot. All on foot, yeah. They'd have a big parade. Have probably, it's just in the days when I wouldn't play, but they'd have a band there to lead them, as they did, and they'd lead you, everybody, to the, the big top ground, where there'd be the menagerie set up, Remember, I've got a picture I remember taking of Robert Brothers elephants coming down Salisbury Road years and years ago and going to the a site in Elkett Lane somewhere, probably the old um, 
football ground they were going all these elephants nose to tail coming down the <laughs> thing drew lots of people out to see these things well we'll move on yeah. um, I hear on the grapevine that you've recently given a talk on the major fires in the town over the past 40 years what can you tell us well we've had one or two really big ones there which stands out in my mind this is not in order of of happening maybe Pelham's Puppets they had a big fire in October 1961 I said earlier it was a big employer of the town and this was um, an evening time that um, all thousands of puppets got burnt nearly the whole factory was burnt out the office department was saved but a big tragedy for the people brought lots of people into the town as soon as they heard this was going up people came from far and wide to see what they could do to help save things of course the fire was too intense for people to get too near and it was fierce frightening really to hear the tins of paint exploding a little bit frightening in the dark nights october you were really a bit worried about that there do they know how it started i think they had um suspicion there might have been a cigarette end somewhere left to smolder or maybe an electrical fault but um it was a bit of a tragedy for the town because they had all these orders which they were getting ready for Christmas, so we say then, October, so they had to. I think they opened again in some form within about 10 days. They got over some temporary premises and fitted it up with machinery and that, and had to work like Billy O to cash up place. But it was a major tragedy for the, for the factory there. That was the Pelham's one. Another one, again not in order, is the Poly Tea Rooms. In, in the high street in 1966 we were talking about that one there and it's certainly left a mark isn't it it uh, is the, which, which is still in evidence it is yeah, when you go down you can still see some of the um, scorch marks on a part of the building that is, they've never rebuilt the top two floors again yes I don't know why because usually in places like that uh, local authorities insist things go back to as they were if you go down to the high street, you can still see the scorch marks there. This was a big one, and as much that it uh, not only did it have the local things, but they called in engines from Ramsbury, Pusey, and Swindon, and they reckon there was a total of about 35 men came to that one. And it is notorious because there were two children were rescued from the, the upper floors there before the, it all collapsed by two local firemen, not as opposed to the other one, was George Johnson, a cousin of mine, and um, Robert Cox, who both received bravery awards, probably the only two awards they, the Morbid Fire Brigade had. This fire was also notable in as much as it caused special meetings of the council on that, and thereafter that, it made a lot of difference to the affairs which were held in the town, that caravans were never allowed in the street after that. The next fire occurred on Thursday, October the 9th, 1975, at Dyber and Roy's Furniture Store, number 31 to 34 in the High Street there. This was even bigger than the one we've just mentioned at the Poly Tea Rooms, because the building was a fine range of houses built in the 17th century, Re really a bit of parts of Marlborough history, the building. And this fire, as I said before, furniture shops had all sorts of bits and pieces in there which were highly flammable. This one started in a store at the back of the building and in no time spread right through to the front, eventually exploding all the front windows. They went right out into the street. The whole building got was quickly burnt out, but adjoining houses were saved. This was obviously thanks to the skill of the firefighters. According to reports, there was a total of 12 fire engines in attendance and 60 men fought the blaze very much a big thing, drew half the town out to watch this one, it's funny how news travels fast there and as it's normal procedure in fires of this size that a whole high street is sealed off and diversions come in use so the police are well involved in this thing here, the nearby residents and shops were evacuated and the priory residents although that set, the priory was set back off the road, where the fire started was near to the rear of the priory so they were assembled ready to leave they didn't have to leave in the end, but after all the heat and that, they, they had a pair of cuts, so they were, rumours had it, or witnesses say that, they sang old songs just to keep the spirits up until power was restored. It's lucky nobody was injured 
Mm. Nobody died in that one. Very lucky on that It was that a one. very intense fire, wasn't Very it? much so, yes. The heat was incredible, Oh, I dear, remember. you could stand at the top side of the high street, right across the wide street. It's a big wide yeah. street, as you well know. And you could feel the warmth across there. Very, very fierce. Particularly intense. on a on an evening of that time of the year. Yeah, very much so. You know, it was a cold night, and you were, you could feel that right across there. And, and the they crowds had to move were the tremendous fire. as yeah. well, weren't they? Because I was going to say thousands. Isn't that a big big estimate maybe but probably they had crowd barriers to keep them back very very swift and what around. I remember was the huge jet black mushroom Ooh, smoke horrible yeah it suddenly emerged Just from the went, middle of the town that was from the foam and all the 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 fillings from the, the it was, it was yeah, incredible it, it was. really was it had to be seen to be believed and I think that as much as anything drew people into the it did it was town. huge you could see it from all around the town and probably from miles out of the town it was such a big place and the flames would be seen on a dark night there and also it was so fierce that the next morning when people went to work there were still two fire engines there damping down they were there for a day or two afterwards because um, it was in danger of spouting up again and it was so sad that this triple gabled yeah, uh, building that has been lost. Lovely it building that was, yeah, building, it's all it? gone. Yeah. This now houses the one stop shop and the, the post office now, but it's not a pretty building up against yeah, the original it's, it's, one. It's a very modern It is, yeah, it stands yeah, out differently design. to the other, yes. Yeah. As we say, in the end, it was lucky that nobody lost their life. Absolutely. That particular fire, was it a lot worse than the fire that happened in 1955 with the tannery? Do you remember? Yes, I would think so. Yes, the in as much as there is more fire people there working. Although yep. the tannery one, that one came in 1954. That was on February the second. That was a big one. Obviously, we had um, fire engines from Swindon as well. That was a, a thing there. But the the thing this was notorious for is a bitterly freezing night with a a fierce wind. This is from newspaper we watched it. It said that the um, conditions were so bad that the water coming out of the hoses either turned to steam when it, it were at the fire or else it froze and so badly that all the ladders froze up they had to send two men up the ladder at a time so one would grip onto the other to stop him from falling down it was very very freezing I can remember I lived in Kingsbury City and I remember toddling down the road to see that one and it was cold bitter bitter cold did it do much damage? it burnt it out hmm. they had to rebuild the um tannery after that one so and were the build buildings very different uh, oh yes they yes they had got more modern you had um, it was a modern building a brick building they made it then I, I remember reading also that when the fire brigade had finished to put this out eventually the, they couldn't roll their hoses up because the, they were solid where the water had frozen inside them on the same subject of fire there's obviously been the invention of firemen's radios and yes. other communication systems in your lifetime. How did they manage before then? There was a siren on top of the town hall, right? And there's a little, um, could be placed right on the top there. And the siren was sounded from there. And in those days, of course, everybody who belonged to the fire brigade were in earshot of the town hall. You could hear this siren for, but then nobody worked miles away, should we say, because employers were very good. They allowed firemen to go at a minute's notice uh, and what did this, it sound like was it like an air raid it siren? was an air raid siren during the war it was uh, the local air raid siren because in that time during the war if a fire was called out I got an idea some form of a bell was used to call they couldn't use this siren then because everybody thought it was a, an air raid so that wasn't used then but um, eventually went over to um, radios I know at the time when they had the siren it was always a a big thing when the siren went you went to the door when my daughter was small and you're perhaps having your dinner you hear the siren go and it was a case of come on carry them to the door and just watch the fire engine go this out. would be in the early 70s in the early 70s yeah they were still using the siren then because it was a big thing to see a, a fire engine nowadays they go around all day mm. and you've got sirens going all day and you day. could hear it all the way down here in London Road what hear the siren yeah. oh yes you could hear that yes it was a fireman used to live across the road and they used to test the bells for a night they used to test the bells um, 7 o'clock in the morning you could hear his bell just being tested yeah. to test run mate saw that was going well and then they went over to radios yeah. uh, but before that happened one night the, the siren itself caught fire so I don't know how they really called the fire engine out they must have called by their house bells or something <laughs> for that one there that was a late one evening that one caught fire I think my wife can verify that one she was on the bus going home then the fire siren caught fire so it's <laughs> a different story 
Now, if I may say, what you've told us today, Alf, and yesterday has been absolutely fascinating. You've gone into so much detail. But just before we round off, I wonder if you could tell me how you think the town has changed most in your lifetime. Probably the biggest thing, as with probably other towns, any of this would be, is the traffic. Years ago, you could walk across the road without any trouble at all. It was silent during the night, but there's a, such a, a busy route. Despite the opening of the M4 in 1974, which at the time took a lot of traffic away, but since that 30 years, traffic has increased everywhere. And where we lost the uh, London to Bath traffic or London to Bristol traffic, we now got a lot of north-south traffic coming through all night and all day. And... Obviously, parking it doesn't worry me. I don't don't drive out on a car now. But this parking is a big problem in Morwood, very much so. But people tell me it's easier to park in bigger towns than it is Morwood, but that's uh, as far as the way things goes. Businesses have changed a lot. The old-fashioned little places have gone. We've now seemed to have gone over the years from a small market town to a rather more of an upmarket place with the boutiques that come in. This is a thing that has to come where you get different people coming into a town. Things have changed. Lots of these new estates bring different people into the town, all with different ideas, which, really speaking, all must be good for a town. you either got to progress or else you go backwards. You don't stay static all the time. So I think we're progressing on that. Maybe we've got our share of um, perhaps older people's places now. We mustn't become too many of them. And hopefully with the coming of the White Horse Business Park, we might have some more business, which will help the young people. They need to go out of town to get the good jobs and the prices of houses drive a lot of the youngsters away to, to if they want to start into houses on their own they've got to go out of town which we're losing some of the the true Morburians but on the other hand we're getting other people in so we're getting a good variety of, of people it's still a lovely place to live whatever now I've deliberately stayed off your pet subject of Morbremont Fairs Elf because I think in months to come we can probably fill another couple of tapes <laughs> with your <laughs> recollections and history that you've gathered on these historic events. So um, we've deliberately not discussed that on this occasion, but can I for the meantime, on behalf of the Oral History Project, say thank you very much for giving up your spare time to talk to us. Yeah, thank you for asking me in the first place. I, When this first came up, I thought, I can't know too much about it, but when we start looking into detail, I seem to go on forever and ever. I hope we haven't bored anybody and I hope anybody who listens to this won't think what a big head he is or anything like that because I've got the, hopefully I'll still have the interest of this town and hope I still will have it for a few more years to come. Thank you very much for asking me. It's been a great pleasure and privilege. For us both I may say. Thank you.